All right, uh, thanks. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lionel. I'm going to be presenting on evolving high availability of rain trees. So I'll talk about both what we have right now that's running in production and what we had previously and how we got from one to the other. Uh, when I was putting these slides together, I realized that we're actually talking about these things in reverse order. I'm going to talk about, I'll mention who I am. I'll talk a little bit about the company I work for uh, because it's kind of relevant to the story. And then I'll talk about what we do for HA. And then I'll talk about how it's changed. So we'll go in that order. So what is, uh, who am I? Uh, my name's Lionel, I'm a software engineer at Braintree. I've been here for about three and a half years. Um, I'm mostly an application developer, so I sort of work on like backend systems uh, at the application layer. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple things that we use like um, kernel modules that I'm not that familiar with. Um, so if we have some deep questions about like IPVS, I'm not gonna be able to answer them. I might delegate to John Downey, who's also from Braintree in the front row. Um, but yeah, so, so that's really like the, the perspective you're getting is, is a person who has worked uh, around some of these things or with, within the framework of the, the systems that are, we've constructed or on some of them directly. Um, but I'm not quite like a operations person. Even though high availability is at least as much an operational concern as, is, as it is a dev, uh, dev concern. Okay, so who, what is Braintree? And so at a conference like this, like, you know, like it's a little, it's not quite silly to like get up and like talk about your product a whole lot, right? Because we're here to talk about technology. Um, but I think it's important that you guys understand like what we, who we are and what we're doing so that you understand the sort of like the constraints and problems that we're faced with solving. So Braintree is a payment processing company. That means that if other companies want to accept payments online, they have to use a, uh, us or a company like us in order to do that securely and safely and sort of in a compliant way with the different regulations that exist. Um, so we're based in Chicago, we have offices kind of all over. We do not have an office in Canada, so I can't really say we're hiring people in Canada. Although we might be, I'm not 100% sure. Um, yeah, we got, uh, the size of the engineering team is around 120 people, but some of the components I'm gonna be talking about that we built, we built when we were much smaller, like 10 to 20 engineers. Um, and we've been acquired by PayPal, but we still operate pseudo independently. Um, so who are people who would use Braintree? Uh, so this is like kind of just, a, I stole this slide from a sales deck just people who are on our, on our platform generally. So you have like big companies like Uber and Airbnb and GitHub. These are like big sophisticated technology companies that know how to use a, a payment platform and get the most out of it. But also in addition to these larger companies, we also have a lot of people who are sort of like, you know, just mom and pop e-commerce shops that are manufacturing their uh, artisanal scented candles and selling them online. And it's, you know, they're trying to make a living in the 21st century that way. And we wanna be able to support both those people and these huge tech companies that kind of know what they're doing. Uh, not that other people don't know what they're doing, but there's certainly a level, of, there's degrees of sophistication in our customer base. So um, the reason why I'm mentioning these customers and stuff like that is not to be like, oh, we're awesome, we have cool customers. It's because, it's to emphasize a, a really important point, which is that for us, having our API be up all the time is something of a like solemn responsibility for us because if we are down, these companies are effectively not open for business because they can't process your, your credit card, they can't process your PayPal account, whatever. They don't know like if your credit card account is valid, they, the number you give them works. So they can't charge you, and they're not gonna be able to deliver their goods or services. So for us, it's sort of like we're the silent partner in the background supporting these companies, but in a way we're sort of critical to their operational like success. We see, uh, we take this responsibility very, very seriously because like I said, everyone from small, uh, com small startups that are just getting started to large tech companies are counting on us to make sure that they can accept payments. Um, and, you know, like we actually do a lot of volume. So this is uh, the last public number that we had was announced, I think, in October. Uh, but something on the order of $50 billion a year in US, I should say, uh, flows through our primary gateway. Um, which when I'm sort of talking to new hires or pitching new engineers and I kind of want to put the fear of God into them, I'm like, you'll be on call for a system that handles like $100,000 a minute. Um, which is, you know, a little bit more exciting than I think uh, clicking likes and sharing photos. Um, but yeah, so again, to reiterate, we can't take the API down ever, ever, ever. It's, it's critical that we do this, that we keep things up, not just because like we lose money or trust from our, our, uh, you know, our business, but because we're supporting these thousands of other businesses. Uh, okay, so from a technical perspective, how does this actually look? Well, so 
the general way, the general sort of name of the game uh, with payment providers is that they have to provide you an API that allows you to do things in a securing PCI compliant way. So this is a flow where it is what sort of is called tokenization. So a consumer will visit a website, in this case I'm picking on GitHub, uh, and they will say sort of like, I want to upgrade my GitHub subscription and I want to start paying them seven bucks a month for private repos or so forth. Um, we will send a, you know, GitHub will render a JavaScript sort of widget in their page that allows the user to uh, send their credit card uh, securely to Braintree's tokenization service. We respond with a token. The user then does a normal HTTP post to the to GitHub server with a token, and then GitHub passes it back to us in our client library, sort of saying like, charge this token, you know, seven bucks a month recurring for this service. And so we then look up the credit card number from our database since we just got it, and we pass it on to a processor. A processor is sort of a generic term we use to refer to entities that process uh, credit card payments. Uh, it, typically, you can imagine it as a bank or bank-like institution or an arm of a bank. It's sort of, it's a bank type thing. Um, so the reason why this is important is that we have this API. Uh, it's a very write-heavy workload. We, uh, I think, the, uh, I, I, don't quote me on this, I think something like a slim majority of API requests we get are writes, but it's around 50-50, uh, which is unusual. Most APIs are not like that. Uh, in fact, many, many web services are 99% reads, right? Um, but not only that, but not only is it, is it write heavy, but if you look at this, in order for us to do the API requests we're getting from GitHub in step three, we have to synchronously call out to a third party. So. You are, if you have built a, a system that uses a payment processor, you're familiar with this, you have to call it to the payment processor to do something. It turns out the payment processor itself is probably gonna call out to another thing. Uh, and we have to do this on like almost all of these uh, requests we get that are, that are writing, you know, that are charging a credit card. So we, this, in practice, this means that we are blocking on IO quite a lot, like much more than it would be if we're just reading and writing from a database. Okay. And again, to, to reiterate, uh, Dropping requests, like screwing the stuff up, it directly means a loss of money for a, one of our customers. Not, it's not like we lost money in the sense that like hypothetically the clicks that we have dropped would turn into ad revenue in some future magical you know, land. It's no, like someone was trying to transfer money from one person to another. And so we dropped on the floor, that's not good. So that's why we, we don't do it. Um, okay, so what does this look like architecturally? I think it's a little bit standard, uh, so you have the consumers and the, the merchants are talking to a load balancer, which talks to something else. And then we use Rails as our backend for our primary application. Rails will then you know, talk to the, uh, the processor, the bank, or whatever. Rails is backed by Postgres. And then you have a collection of sort of like downstream stuff from the web service. So you have, uh, I actually left off like three or four other databases. <laughs> you know, it's like RabbitMQ is also in there. Kafka is in there, Elasticsearch. And then there's basically stuff. There's batch processing systems that are downstream. There's sort of a whole lot of other, other things going on. Um, but we sort of, for the purposes of this talk, we can kind of simplify this. Um, it's, it's a more or less standard web architecture. You have load balancers, you have web services, you have a database. Uh, it's sort of like more built up than like maybe your standard Rails deployment, but it is, it should be familiar. Um, in our case, we actually use a tiered and sharded relational database. So we sort of have uh, we we have a notion of a Postgres cluster, which is a you know primary node plus a synchronous standby and an asynchronous standby, and uh, we have I think like some number of uh, of sort of like metadata tiers, uh, metadata clusters, and then we have some bigger number of actual data clusters that are are running to sort of simplify things. Um, so it's a tiered and sharded Postgres cluster, but nonetheless, it is just Postgres. Um, similarly, we have tiered load balancers and proxies, and I'm sort of going to simplify this diagram to this one for purposes of this talk, because I don't think you guys have to worry too much about what we use Kafka for. Um, that's sort of later on. Okay, so yeah, like I said, you, you have the consumers and the merchants, they talk to the load balancer, and the load balancer talks to, what is that? The, this, this proxy thing? You know, who, what? It's sitting in between Rails and the load balancer, so that's where your sort of unicorn would typically go if you're familiar with that sort of thing. Um, yeah, who knows what that is? Uh, I will be talking about this in a minute. But first, let's talk a little bit more about like high availability. I want to get through sort of like with how the load balancing tier works before I get to the proxy. Okay, so who here has like heard the term high availability before in a kind of like more rigorous definition than just like have it be up, yay? Yeah. 
This is like, this is a very familiar concept now. People are sort of, it's commonplace in the industry to talk about the number of nines you hit. Um, so, and so yeah, it's sort of like if you are, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm realizing this is hard to read. Um, but yeah, so if you are uh, taking the website down, let's just say once a quarter to do a deployment, uh, and it's down for a day, then you've had like three, four uh, days of downtime a year, you've hit two nines of avail availability. So does anyone's bank do that? Like my bank basically will do this. They'll be like, They'll be like, sorry guys, you can't use your bank this Saturday online because we're doing maintenance. Uh, which is pretty like, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so yeah, it's like, come on. Like, um, on, the, on the extreme end, you would have sort of uh, very, very highly available systems would be things like the Google primary search engine or sort of like you can imagine telephone switching networks at the core of like, you know, the phone routing system. These would be systems that have like, five or six nines of availability, which means that you know, under a minute, you know, minutes or less of downtime every year, which is very hard to achieve in practice, but it has been done by dedicated organizations. Um, most sort of web applications that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, if they are done well, will be between three and five nines of availability. Um, I don't really know what the number for Bintry is. We obviously want to be up all the time, but it's, uh, you know, it's, we're, I think we do a pretty good job of this stuff. So what, what takes down systems that people are trying to uh, keep up, like generally speaking, I'm actually sort of wondering if people can shout out things, you know, like what takes down a system that people are trying to keep up? DDoS. DDoSs, okay, so, so some sort of external thing that, you know, someone's attacking you. Whoa, okay, that was eight different. What? Software upgrade. I still didn't get that, sorry. Software upgrade. Oh, oh, upgrading your software. So, yes, software upgrades. So uh, that is like the developers inside the system made a change to the system. And in order to do this, you had to take it down temporarily because you like, couldn't run two versions of it simultaneously or you only had one instance of the thing. So you had to kind of take it down and then upgrade it and then bring it back up, right? Justin you. Bieber. Oh, Justin Bieber, yes. So you... Posted a picture on Instagram and their system down. Yes, you, you, you had this like huge rush of traffic equivalent to DDoS almost in terms of like the way you conceptualize it is like, oh crap, we have like all these, you know, all of a sudden way more traffic. Um, yeah. What? AWS outage. AWS outage. Okay, so some sort of component that you're counting on in your system fails you, possibly in a systemic way. Uh, so these are, these are all sort of like categories. So I think that I've actually heard, I would say there's two distinct categories of answers here. There's sort of like, there's sort of like chaos, there's, there's entropy, there's like the world throwing problems at you, like AWS goes down, uh, or like some jerk like DDoSes you, whatever. There's, there's things that you can't control, or maybe you can sort of only marginally control where things are gonna go wrong, you, you have to deal with chaos. But you also have to deal with what you were pointing out, is that the system itself is changing over time, often quite rapidly. So high availability is faced with two different sets of uh, problems. You have to deal with like the underlying chaos of like living in, in a world that's not perfect, and you also have to deal with the underlying problems of like how do you change the system while still keeping it up. Uh, the frequent metaphor is like if you're on a plane and you need to upgrade the engines and you can't land the plane. <laughs> uh, so okay, so the first enemy you have is, is chaos. Um, I'm sort of gonna set aside the DDoS or Justin Bieber example a little bit and focus more on like sort of component failure. Um, but so you have, you have a whole lot of things that are running inside your system, uh, application servers, databases, whatever, and those things are in some sense fragile. They will break. You know, you can say, we as the like sort of programmers can say, oh, the hardware, you know, the hardware's gonna break, it's unreliable. Modern hardware is actually really pretty reliable, <laughs> um, but like in, pra in practice, like it doesn't really matter, like eventually things will, f will fail. And so the sort of approach people take in industry is you focus on recovering quickly rather than preventing failure. So this is optimizing for what's called mean time to recovery rather than mean time to failure. Or you wanna minimize, I ideally you would minimize both of those things, but if you had to pick modern sort of practices to optimize mean time to recovery. Okay, so if you have many things that you have like cop you know, redundant copies of your things, what you often want to do is sort of make those things appear to be just one thing. Um, so everyone knows an example of this, right? Like what's a really obvious example of this? Or maybe I shouldn't say obvious because we're, we're here to learn and it's a safe environment. What's, what's an example of this? 
Yeah, so database clustering, where you have sort of a, uh, a leader node that's accepting reads and writes, and it has sort of a, a standby, whereas like if someone kicks out the power cable on the primary, it will, or the leader, it would immediately fall over to the follower, right? Uh, fail over to the follower. Fall over to the follower. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think uh, another, that's a really good example. Another example, I think, would be like just stateless web applications, uh, where you, a, ver a very typical architecture, I'm sure everyone's interacted with this or done this effectively, is you have a database, and then you have like a stateless tier of processes that, that service web requests, right? And those processes are redundant. Like you can have, if you have like three application servers, one of them can fail and like that's not a big deal. But you need some way uh, of having inbound requests talk to these application servers in a way that like kind of treats them as one. Um, to give a sort of more technical example, you can, you can imagine a world in like the way we build highly available systems is that each DNS entry you have, like you go to <laughs> www.braintree.payments.com and it's got like 18 IP addresses that it could talk to, each of which corresponds to like a single application server. Like that in theory could work. And like, you know, the way you would like do a deployment or something would be that you would like, I don't know, you would restart one, you, you would like remove one entry from DNS and then like restart that node or like deploy new code to that node and then sort of like keep on going. But this is sort of cartoonish because like one, it would take too long. Some people would not respect like DNS uh, TTLs. And two, like what happens if a node fails and you like you haven't planned for it? Like now it's like you're like, oh no, remove it from the DNS record really fast. Like it just won't work. Uh, so what we actually do in practice is that we have some sort of thing that fronts the, these many applications and sort of proxies to them and makes them appear to be one thing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so this is what we call load balancing. So, uh, sorry, ah, I skipped ahead on the slide. But yeah, we basically, we want redundant web servers. We could have a client, the client do this DNS thing that I've described that sort of wouldn't work. Um, so what we have is, what we end up with is a thing that's called a transparent proxy, meaning it doesn't actually mess with the connections at all. It just sort of passes them on to different things, which is also commonly referred to as a load balancer. Um, so, Braintree uses uh, a health check based system of load balancing. So the idea is that we're getting this request from a client. The load balancer has to make a decision about where to send it. And it has, you know, there's three backend nodes that it could relegate, uh, uh, really, that it could send the request to. Uh, and I've listed their relative healths uh, there. And so it's going to be sort of like, oh, OK, the bottom node there is the healthiest. We will route the request there. Right? So I, I choose you. And so the request is rather there transparently. And so I, this is sort of like, to back up, this is sort of like we have to monitor things to make sure that they're healthy. So if the health degrades, we can take automated action. In this case, just simply not sending a request to a damaged node. OK. Come on. OK, so in order to actually do this, what do you actually need? Um, you need two things. You need a health metric on your downstream services. And you need some sort of like decision-making thing that can figure out, based on the health metric, what, to, what sort of actions to take. Um, by the way, this is sort of just only one strategy of, of uh, like web service load balancing. Uh, other strategies such as like round robining requests between nodes or uh, like randomly routing requests, which is what Heroku did for a while, um, is, are, are also common. But okay, so you, so you need like a, a health check and an LB decision making thing. And I think here we're sort of entering a space that like should be familiar us, to us as programmers. So, you, we're starting to think now about like system components that have interfaces and responsibilities, right? So you can imagine that, per, for example, maybe the health checking thing, the thing that knows how to like monitor a service's health and then report it back, is totally separate in almost every way except for that number from the actual load balancing decision making tier. So that's how Braintree does it. We have uh, two open source projects. Um, one is called Litmus Paper. Everyone knows what a Litmus Paper is, actually, right? It's like a in 10th grade chemistry, you would like stick it into like a solution and it would turn yellow if it was acidic or something like that. Um, no? Okay. Yeah. Don't, have, don't have chemistry class in Canada. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, litmus paper uh, is a, a simple Ruby uh, <laughs> DSL that runs a small HTTP daemon on a web service. Uh, on each individual node in the web servers, and you can ping it and say, like, how healthy are you, how healthy are you, and it just reports back a number. And the really great thing about this is that the, uh, this means that this health metric is fully customizable by the application developers. So the, the application developers can say, my service needs a lot of I.O., so like, I will heavily weight, you know, I.O. weight as a, I will heavily emphasize I.O. weight 
in, the, uh, in my applications like health check, right? Because if the IO weight is high, my application is like particularly unhealthy. So the application developers can do that really easily. And then these numbers feed into this other thing, Big Brother. Big Brother is also a sort of uh, a, a thing that runs on the, our load balancing services. And all it knows how to do is sort of ping different services, get their health from litmus paper. And basically it just like runs an algorithm figure for figuring out like how should I route requests. Um, in terms of how does it actually implement the routing of the request at the sort of uh, like HTTP and TCP level, what we use is a thing called Linux IPVS, which is IP virtual systems, uh, virtual services. It is a application level act, uh, entry point into, a into basically like using the kernel's own like networking stack directly to send packets around. So in practice, what this means is that um, Big Brother is responsible for like updating a config file in Etsy somewhere, and then this like the TCP things like magically happen and, and, and requests go to the right place, right, Danny? Pretty much. <laughs> um, so, so this is really cool, right? Like we've very cleanly separated the act of like figuring out how healthy something is from the act of sort of like sending traffic to that thing. Um, so Big Brother, uh, it turns out like. Uh, uh, of the two of these, Big Brother is more complicated because litmus paper is very simple, it's stateless. Big Brother could be stateless, like you can imagine a world in which it just sort of like pings everything and then updates the tables and has no notion of time. But it turns out that in order to do intelligent uh, health-based health load balancing, you need to have some sense of like the progression of an, of an app's health over time. Otherwise, you run into what's commonly called the thundering herd problem, which is like, let's say we have a cluster of three nodes, it's overwhelmed, where we've got just, you know, it's Bieber time. And so we're adding more nodes. And so we add a new node to the thing and it comes in. And it's like existing nodes are all kind of at roughly the same health. They're all at like 20 health. And because they're all the same, they're all kind of getting an equal share of traffic. So we, we add our new node. We're, we're automatically scaling up our thing. And it comes in and the health is 100. And so the load balancer is like, aha, you're our guy for everything. <laughs> And so then it just like knocks the node over and you end up with some mix of sort of thrashing and generally like inefficient allocation of requests. So in order to prevent this problem, you have to, the load balancer itself has to have a sense of time. Like this new node came in, I will ramp up the traffic. And, and that means that it's sort of the function for scheduling things is more complicated than just the input of like these health things is actually sort of like the health over time. Um, but it's still quite isolated and quite understandable. And that's really sort of like, that is our philosophy for dealing with chaos, is that we, um, we know that like, these, just, these systems, these distributed systems, will quickly become really complicated. Um, one way of solving these problems is to have sort of a black box, sort of like super program that is going to you know, monitor the health of all the applications and then make load balancing decisions, like do all this stuff itself. We find that those systems are often very hard to reason about. Um, and so we prefer small composable components which is the worst phrase ever, composable pieces, um, that we can sort of very easily understand what each piece does and therefore reason about how it will behave in failure scenarios. One thing that's really important to understand about building distributed systems is that easy things are easy and almost not worth thinking about. It's the ability to reason about your, the behavior system when things are going well, when queues are not backed up, when requests are processed on time, these are actually not very hard. What's hard is figuring out how do I design a system that fails in intelligent or robust ways when things are not going well, when all of a sudden my queue is full, my queue of requests or whatever, like, and things are not working. You have to fail in intelligent ways, and in order to do that, you really need to make sure that each individual component is very easy to predict what it will do. Okay, um, so I've sort of hoodwinked you there, guys, right? Because I said we'll achieve high availability by having many instances of a resource and we'll make them appear to be one thing by having some sort of load balancing mechanism. But of course, all I did there was like, now we just have one load balancer. <laughs> so all I did was like, kind of like move the problem up a level. Um, so how do you actually load balance load balancers? Um, so this is, you guys are kind of alluding to, this is like what we would commonly call clustering. Uh, and the way we do this uh, at Braintree is we sort of have a notion of a, uh, primary load balancer and sort of secondaries, and each of these load balancers will run a, uh, they're, they're all actually advertising the same virtual IP to our edge routers. And then sort of, if you detect that there's a problem on load 01, all that has to happen for load 02 to start taking those connections is to issue a gratuitous ARP to sort of re-advertise the IP that it accepts traffic on this IP. Um, and then automatically like, you know, 
just the networking will take care of it and start issuing requests to that. So how do you know that your node is unhealthy? And how do you know that you're not going to have multiple load balancers try to take over simultaneously for the same unhealthy one? Uh, for that, we use a system called Pacemaker. And Pacemaker is a generic sort of clustering service that you, allows you to sort of plug in and sort of define, uh, like, this is a service. This is the, what it means to be a leader. This is what it means to be a follower here. and this is what it means to fail over between them. In this case, fail over is really easy. You just re-advertise your IP address, and it's fine. Um, this is really cool because, uh, yeah. So the, 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 the load balancers form a pacemaker cluster. They route using IPVS, as I mentioned. And you just issue a gratuitous ARP. But the awesome thing is that because of TCP retry in HTTP connections, we actually don't lose any requests when we fail over a load balancer in this way. Because it's like kind of like, oh, like I just dropped some packets. And then the packets like die, and then the TCP retries, and you go to the right place eventually. Um, so that's kind of nice. OK, so I've described two basic fundamental strategies for dealing with the chaos side of high availability. There's uh, making many things appear to be one, using some sort of load you know, some sort of proxying load balancing thing. And then you have clustering, which is sort of having, uh, having only a single uh, instance of a thing be active at once, but having very fast automated recovery uh, when things fail. So as we discussed, though, there's another problem that building high availability systems faces that's not just chaos. It's not just like the entropy of the universe. We also have to deal with the fact that our, ch our systems are changing. Um, so systems ch our systems change a lot. In particular, like s the systems that are maintained by startups that are in a competitive environment with a very active dev team change a lot, a lot. Right? We've all experienced this. So you have these annoying developers, and they constantly want to deploy new code. They want to rewrite the database schema every Tuesday. The operations people like wake up, and they're like, wait a minute, we should totally have a totally different network, network topology. Um, th and this happens constantly. And sort of like if, you, if your overall like, approach to high availability can't handle these changes, you're just going to take yourself down effectively. And, and this is basically what these banks are doing, right? When they're like, uh, every, you know, every Tuesday on the first quarter, you know, we're just going to be down. And it's because they're doing this sort of stuff. So they, they have decided to handle the chaotic element of high availability, but not the change management. So how do we deal with this? Um, similar to how we sort of have segmented out like the problems that an HA system faces into two types, I think that you can sort of often segment out like what types of changes will happen to the system. So it turns out that most changes to an online system are migrations to the database or deployments of new code. In fact, almost always deployments of new code, often accompanied by migrations to the database. And then sort of like operational changes, which tend to be easier to manage anyways. Um, so how do, you, how do you manage that? The most obvious thing to do is like do as much as possible up front and just have like a very fast cutover when you're cutting over to new stuff, right? So when you deploy code, don't like take everything down and then you know, SCP the new code over and then run it. That's just dumb. Like, it's just take, take basic steps like that. Uh, but sometimes, though, like, you still have a problem where it's like, well, we could do this in, like, a really safe, robust way, but it would just, like, take two weeks or it would take, like, seven deploys. Uh, and you kind of want to cheat. So how do you cheat? This is where I think Braintree came up with a pretty, uh, a little unusual solution, but uh, not an unwelcome one. So remember this thing. The proxy is how we came up with a way of cheating at, at high availability that allowed us to like, completely take our system down for very short periods of time without anyone noticing. How does it work? This is the slide that has a slight uh, typo. In reality, actually, each, the, each proxy node corresponds to a single Apache node. So that was the error. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, the proxy, I will say this a couple times because it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around the first time you hear it. The Broxy is a Python Tornado app, so it's an invented thing, very similar to like a Node.js server. It is responsible for accepting incoming HTTP requests from uh, Apache. It takes the entire body of the HTTP request, including like the headers and the params and like everything else. It puts it into a Redis queue. Like it, it serializes the string into a, puts in Redis. Then a dispatcher, which is our word for a Rails process that listens for requests in Redis rather than listening for HTTP like on port 80 or something like that. Um, the dispatcher pulls this request from Redis, you know, and now it has everything it needs to understand it. It processes the request. Maybe it calls out to a third party. Maybe it just writes some stuff to a database, whatever. 
Then it takes the entire response body, puts that back into Redis. Then the proxy pulls it over, hands it back to Apache, and the whole thing goes about on its merry, merry way, right? So everyone's with me on how this works. It's, it's Apache pushes, pushes the proxy, the proxy takes the stringified request body, pushes it to Redis, then we pull from Redis to the Rails processes and then send everything back in its, in its way. So the question was, is this so that we can reprocess requests if they've failed? Um, I think that could be a theoretical application of this. Um, you would have to know that, for example, the request is idempotent because you'd have to, or you have to know that it failed for sure and it wasn't just like a false positive. Um, in practice, I think that that, it would be tricky because you have to tell the client that's connected to Apache something. So you have to say either, you, you'd either have to have a policy that's like, I actually failed, but I will tell you that I succeeded. Or you will say, uh, it failed, I'm going to reprocess it and it might eventually succeed. And then you have to have a way of like out of band notifying the client that it actually worked in the form of a webhook or something probably. Um, so that, that could potentially work, but it is not something we actually ever did. Um, no, but, but what does this allow you to do though? So has anyone spotted what this allows you to do? That uh, This is an idea of it. Like in terms of like maintenance, what does this allow you to do? You, you could turn off all of your Rails apps for half a second. Yes, yes. Or, or maybe longer than half a second. <laughs> so, so what happens if you take down the Rails processes, right? Because they're just, they're pulling. If you take down the Rails processes, you just get a fat Redis. Like Redis fills up with these requests. It's a it's a FIFO queue. So at the rest, the, so like the last request at the front is the first, is the earliest one you got. <coughs> Redis just like keeps on filling up, and then maybe you deploy totally new code. You restart the Rails processes, and then you bring them back up. And from the perspective of the client that's like got this TCP connection to Apache, it looks like the request just was slow. But in reality, the app was totally down. Like. Just a hundred, so we use this to move our data center like across town. This is before I arrived at Braintree, but we do we do we used to do like crazy stuff with this. Uh, <laughs> maybe foreshadowing this. So basically, like what we've done is we've introduced a pull step into the HTTP processing pipeline, which it usually does not have, and this allows us to to take down downstream systems entirely, effectively pausing traffic for a short period of time. Um, now, how long could you actually do this? We used to do thirty seconds windows of like uh, like the the request will just Basically, we, the, the time from when the Rails processes or whatever go down to the time when we bring them back up and they start accepting, they start reprocessing the request had to be like less than 30 seconds was our guideline. Uh, but like in principle, you can get away with whatever you can get away with where the client like won't just assume you've timed out. Um, this is great, right? Like, uh, do we have change in hope? Uh, this, but the thing is, this is a, a picture of the current US President, um, Barack Obama. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's the Trudeau guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so we can now make like totally crazy changes to our system, and as long as the operation to transfer, to, to switch from one version of the system to another takes a relatively small amount of time, you can do this totally seamlessly because at the sort of edges of the system, you've been able to pause all traffic. Um, which is great. Um, with the caveats, the op must, must be fast. You must also have uh, processing capacity much greater than throughput, so you can actually recover. Uh, so if you're at basically like at capacity and you, do, you did a with proxy deploy, you would not recover fast enough to process intermediate requests in the queue, uh, and you would drop something, which is bad. Um, cool, so this is great, right? This is what Braintree does, uh, or, or is it? <laughs> so. That was a really good description of our systems in, I think, maybe the, by the end of 2014. Um, to review, we had these problems and we used Big Brother, Pacemaker, Apache, Proxy, Rails, Postgres. Um, and so now to put the evolving, evolving, in evolving high availability at Braintree, this is how things change. Uh, and can you see that? Oh man, I knew I should have made this like red or something. Uh, there's a strike through on Apache and Proxy. So we, we got rid of those components. We, we killed the proxy. So we used to have this really cool system of pausing traffic and stuff like that, and we don't run it in production anymore. We got rid of it uh, a while ago. So a little bit of letdown. But okay, so uh, why would we do this? Because as I've described, the proxy actually was awesome and it allowed us to make these cool changes and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of reasons that all kind of came together at once. 
First and foremost, we had operational problems with it. Um, serializing requests in and out of Redis is easy at first when you're sort of just like doing it naively, and then it's hard. Like, what happens if the response body is like 200 megabytes? Can your Redis client handle that? <laughs> we found out it, it could not. <laughs> um, what if there's like a chunked HTTP response? I guess you kind of just have to like wait. Uh, it's, there, there's sort of like weird edge cases there that you have to deal with over time. Um, mixing the push and pull workflows is really useful, and it's actually, in a sense, the entire point. But operationally, it actually adds a lot of complexity. So you have to, if you're trying to do maintenance on these systems at these different tiers, you have to sort of figure out like what order do I restart things in if I'm like doing a rolling upgrade. It's actually not obvious to that because you might think like, oh, I'll take down the downstream thing, and then like you know the load downstreams will handle it and I'll go fine. But you can actually screw yourself up and drop requests that way. Um, the dispatchers don't even listen to HTTP. So we have these Rails processes that are running that are listening to like the Redis client port as like their incoming service thing, which is crazy town. Um, this means that you actually can't have a health check that hits the Rails process that doesn't go through this, this pipeline or maybe has some like alternate entry into Redis, right? Um, which means that monitoring the, that particular Rails process in isolation can be quite hard. Um, the code base itself for the proxy got more complicated. Uh, we wanted to do rate limiting and monitoring, but we, and, and the proxy is like kind of in a good position to do that because it's in the HTTP stack, it's in the middle like before you've done any work, uh, and, but, it's, but it still has all the information needed to make intelligent decisions. Um, and before anyone freaks out, they're like, wait a minute, the payment processor was gonna do like rate limiting? Uh, that doesn't sound good. Like what if I have a successful sale and like I'm selling a lot of scented candles? Like that's terrible. Um, we have a responsibility to make sure that like badly behaved or you know overly successful clients that we have don't sort of use all of our resources and therefore block out everyone else in the system. So this is sort of like this is actually a pretty classic like API design conundrum where it's like uh, it's possible for someone to sign up for a Braintree account and then just sort of do something dumb like wild true you know ping Braintree and do some expensive operation. And if they do that, we have to make sure that like that doesn't take down the system for everyone else. So for that reason, we had sort of some sort of slow down rate limiting uh, that we consider putting in place. Um, right, and so the proxy could do this, but it, the more we tried to make it do it, the more complicated this code got. Uh, we also found that the proxy violating this sort of earlier principle of keep things simple, easy to understand in failure cases, there were sort of potential issues of like failure here creating self-reinforcing performance problems. So for example, an issue that we avoided but could have happened was that it could be that like you have an operation that like assesses the length of the queue in the proxy, and the longer that queue gets, the like more expensive this like list operation is. Um, so you have to denormalize the length of the queue somewhere and like keep it counter updated. So we, we did that stuff, but this sort of adds complexity to the code base. Um, but Braintree has a good dev team, I like to think, and we could have handled these problems. If we had sat down, we were like, we are committed to the proxy uh, four more years, you know, and just gone with that, we could have done it. But at the same time as we were having these problems, it was getting a lot less useful. Um, so when you have a Rails application and you, and you are bringing it up, the boot time depends greatly on like basically the size of the code base because it's Ruby, it's like it's gonna load and like do all the stuff at, at boot time and like create new classes, blah, blah, blah. Um, so by like the time that I'm talking about, we started to consider ripping it out, booting the Rails app was taking 10 to 15 seconds. So that means that if you have a 30 second window in which you do your fancy proxy stuff, half of it is eaten, in, eaten up by restarting the new version of the code. Uh, so that just means that like it's already like half as useful, right? Um, and finally, like, I think we just had better alternatives in 2014, 2015 than we did in 2011. Um, in particular, we, one of the really common like, proxy operation that we would do is if you're gonna fail over your Postgres cluster from one to another, like let's say you have to upgrade the hardware on one of your primary Postgres nodes. You could do this by pausing traffic, failing over really seamlessly, and then just like, keep on going. Uh, and this means that like, your database layer can have like, a rough failover story and you're fine. Um, but we introduced a, a tool called PG Bouncer, which is a connection pooling thing for Postgres. And when we introduced PG Bouncer, PG Bouncer actually has a really robust failover story between different nodes in a Postgres cluster. So we didn't need to use the proxy for that operation anymore. Uh, similarly, uh, sort of other high availability, high availability like proxy systems, most notably HA proxy, kind of matured a lot. So we found that we were going to be able to get a lot of the benefits we wanted from the proxy out of using HA proxy. 
Uh, and Entry Proxy is this like big famous open source system that is like battle tested and used by a lot of people. Um, generally speaking, like you can get away with using that as opposed to writing your own stuff, you should. So yeah, we, we ripped it out. Um, it was really hard to rip out. It, it was one of these projects that has very much a like one step forward, two steps back character, where it's like you take a change, you bring it to a stage environment, then you realize that like something very subtle is broken, and you have to roll back and like keep on going. But it, it's done, and it's dead now. Um, so, how do we make changes now that we can't? We don't have this like magic stop the world mechanism. Well, we just kind of have to do it the hardware. Uh, you know, add the new thing, migrate to the new thing, sp you know, remove the old thing, or you know. That's like what you would do if you were like adding a new database table and moving some data around, right? Just typically, you had just have to do a whole bunch of deploys in sequence, such that at any given point in time, the system is totally operational and working. Uh, it's significantly more engineering work than sort of having this like pause switch in which you can do something really clever and dramatically switch in a backwards incompatible way. Uh, but I found that this has actually pushed us to a place that's like a little bit better anyways, because we've been forced to make our deployments much more robust, reliable, and common, which is a good thing to do in it regardless. Um, <coughs> yeah, I'm gonna skip this discussion of database table stuff because it's not that interesting. One thing I will say though is that we would not have been able to do a lot of this stuff without Postgres, because Postgres is like really, really awesome for um, the sorts of things that often challenge people when they're running a a uh, relational database online a large period of time. In particular, uh, for certain versions of MySQL, and I'm not a MySQL expert, so this might not be true anymore, um, common operations like adding a new table, uh, sorry, adding a new column or renaming a table or, re or you know, things like that would require MySQL to essentially internally rewrite the table, uh, taking out an exclusive lock, which means that you're basically down for using that table. So those sorts of migrations were extremely painful and like, had to be done very carefully. With Postgres, all that stuff is essentially just an update to the metadata on the table, which is very fast and does not require an exclusive lock. Um, moreover, things like creating indexes can be done concurrently and in the background, which is fantastic. Uh, and almost best, of, almost best of all, I would say, is that schema changes can be done transactionally. Meaning, so let's imagine that you are doing a schema change and it fails halfway through. So you're now in an inconsistent state, right? Like you've got half of your schema changes happened, the other half hasn't. The app was never built, so the app generally was built and tested to use either one set of side of the schema change or another. It's not usually like in between statements. And so if you're using a database that doesn't support transactional uh, uh, DDL, then basically like you, you're, you're kind of in a bad place, right? Uh, with Postgres, you can actually roll back the schema change to the previous version and just like, you're fine. Uh, so Postgres in this case, as it's worth an aside, this is really cool. Um, we also have like written a lot of libraries internally for sort of, or, or rather one particular library for ensuring that application developers when they make schema changes do it in a really safe way that takes advantage of these fast uh, and like robust features of Postgres, um, which I don't think we've open sourced yet, but we should. Um. Okay, so bring it all together. Uh, building a highly available system is not easy but it is possible. You have to think carefully about the way, the different pro types of problems you will face and the way you will de devise different strategies for attacking them. Uh, well, yeah, so most things are pretty straightforward in simple situations, but the thing that you really have to think about is how your app will behave in failure cases because easy things are easy, it's the failure cases that are ones that actually matter. Um, the way that we have approached this problem is by making sure that our individual components are simple, understandable, and isolated from each other, and have like clearly defined responsibilities and interfaces. This is just sort of generally good programming practice, but we found it's also essential for understanding a distributed, a complex distributed system. Uh, and I think that that particular philosophy has kind of been borne out over time, because we have written our own load balancing and health monitoring stack, and we've been running it in production for five years, without basically any changes to the overall arc. You know, we've added features here or there, or like enhancements or bug fixes, but that basic system has not changed. Uh, it was working when we got very little traffic, and it continues to work now that we're doing like bajillions of dollars. We basically process all the payments at this point. Uh, you know, it continues to work. All right, well, thanks very much.